Hi, and welcome to my roundup of round four of the best chess event in the world. This is like the Olympics for chess, the Chess Olympiad, hence the name, kind of gives it away. And I'm going to take you through the highlights from this round four, and we're going to see some of the best games, some of the biggest shocks, the results and the standings. Now, I haven't done previous rounds, so I thought I'd start here on round four because this is where it starts to get interesting. We get Grandmaster versus Grandmaster clashes. Normally in a tournament like this, the first couple of rounds, you might have some shock results, but all in all, it's pretty much everything goes to plan. So uh, what is the Chess Olympiad? Now, it's an event I've never played in, but I've heard so many great things about. It's where you get the creme de la creme, the Magnus Carsons of the world, brushing sh uh, so shoulders, um, did I say soldiers? Shoulders, <laughs> you know what I mean, with, um, should we say, amateurish players? I mean, if you look at some countries from Africa, other places in the world, the Caribbean, they don't have great chess history, but they certainly bring a lot of character to the tournament. And, you know, it's one of those things where everyone meets in the bar, they have a rest day, they have a famous Bermuda party, where lots of crazy and good things go on away from the board as well as on the board. And it's a great, great event, I hear. I mean, I've only played in the European equivalent to this, not in the Olympiad. And it's something I'd love to go to, maybe, maybe sometime if I can improve my rating. So what has happened? Well, let's start off with Magnus Carlsen. Now, Magnus Carlsen generally has struggled in these team events before. And I think there's a lot of pressure on someone like Magnus because every game he's playing a very good player. He has to play board one. And he's playing normally a 2,500 rated Grandmaster. Now, you may think, OK, he's 300 points higher than these guys, so it should be an easy win. But these guys, and I know because I, I sort of am one, um, can play very good chess and they're not easy to beat, if they, especially as they up their game uh, because it's an honour to play Magnus Carlsen. Now, the names of the players we're going to look at, I'm going to leave below the Komodo evaluation. You can see there, I'm going to leave that running for your benefits. But this is between a, a good friend of mine who writes a brilliant blog for chess.com, David Smurden with the white pieces and Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces. So how did this game go? And Smurden said he prepared for this by listening to some m and &M. You only get one shot, one shot at the moment. So... That's good. So that's some damn good preparation, if you ask me. And Smurden played the C3 Sicilian, and we get to this position here. Um, and now I think he takes a very brave decision because he could now go queen takes queen in this structure, which it looks like a very logical move, and he'd probably have even a slightly, slightly better ending. Well, let's say after black castles, this is always an option. So he could go for some ending where queen takes queen and play to try and draw. Now, there's a good lesson to be made from this. When you're playing someone higher rated, it's much more often a good idea to complicate. Don't simplify into a technical position, especially against someone like Magnus, because they will grind you down. Make it complicated. Make it make it difficult for your opponent. Have a go. Try to attack him. And Smurden really goes for it here. He castles queen side. Now Magnus can take queens, but he decides to go knight d5. And now I think an excellent move, queen g4. Going for some potential kingside attack, but ruining the pawn structure. Magnus took on e3, and now f takes e3. This pawn is, is quite weak, but there's a lot of pressure against the black king. And white has this development advantage. Queen c7 was played, and now David brings his last piece into the game, bishop d3. Very dangerous situation already on move 13 for Magnus here. He's lacking behind in development. David's got his pieces lined up against him, and I bet he was a bit nervous here. He continued with knight d7, trying to play for knight to f6. And now David went queen to f4. Okay, he offers the queen exchange here, but if Magnus decides to take the queens off, white will have a very comfortable position because this bishop on c8 will struggle to get in the game. Slight advantage to white, I'd say. Now in the game, you have to praise Magnus for his brave play. He plays queen c5. 
And now look at the way White plays this. This is how you should play against higher rated player. B4, totally aggressive. Queen C6 and now Knight D4. Gambiting a pawn on G2. Really going for Magnus's throat. All credit to David for this game. Queen takes G2 and now Rook G1. And clearly Black has to be so careful here. Another piece comes into the attack. I'd be terrified with the black pieces here. Queen h3 and now rook g3, just preparing to bring the other rook into the attack. Clearly, extremely good compensation for one pawn. Now, Magnus should po probably play queen h5 here, but he went queen h4. And after now queen takes queen and rook h3, there's a major issue with the h7 square. He played bishop g5, and this is really the hit or miss moment shall we say because in this position white took the draw with rook g1 and this really forces the draw because black is forced to go h6 and now we have a funny seesaw rook takes g5 bishop h7 check and the seesaw bishop comes backwards and forwards ensuring the draw now maybe against a lower rated player here david might have been brave and decided to play on with bishop takes h7 check first. Now the reason I think he didn't do this is after something like king h8, bishop c2 check, Magnus can play bishop h6. So it's no longer a draw. And the way he played it, he forces a draw. Who can blame him? I think against someone else, though, David may well have played this position on. He's still a pawn down, but after a move like knight to f3, which I think is an excellent move, he has brilliant compensation for the pawn, even though the queens are off the board. Ideas with knight to e5, ideas of even bringing the rook around sometimes, and a strong initiative, but a draw is a very good result. So, tough Magnus. Well done, David. And check his blog out on chess.com. Let's move on to the next game, which I thought was uh, critical. And this one is between Grischuk of Russia and Ukraine. So, it's a, it's a Russia versus Grischuk match. And you may have noticed that Karyakin did not take part in this match, maybe for reasons of political correctness, because, of course, he, he used to be a member of the Ukraine Federation, and there's a lot of tension, as you probably know, in that part of the world. Now, the key encounter, actually, Russia lost this match to the underdogs, Ukraine, so I, I bet everyone in Ukraine is cheering, a bit like Eurovision. In America, you may not know what that is, but it's very popular in uh, England. And the critical thing is really um, Grischuk losing with White against a player 100 points lower than him. And I'm just going to show you a little tactical exchange here very quickly. Black in this solid position played pawn takes, well, after bishop h3 from Grischuk, attacking the knight on d7. Black played an extremely inspired idea. I mean, this is an amazing idea now. He went pawn takes c4, leaving his knight to be captured. And this is a stroke of genius and we should point out that um they're playing without a van at the moment ukraine but still some very strong players and the point of this idea is after bishop takes knight queen h5 pressure against f3 attacking that square white played g4 and now the queen comes down here so this knight has to move and there's only one way to stop the checkmate knight e1 and now bishop d3 and I, I love the way that Black played this. Now that we have a forcing sequence, the knight takes this, the queen captures, and the point of this whole combination is rook d8. Okay, white can take a draw here with bishop takes e8, but then Black has, let's just show it on the board, queen takes g4 check, queen f3 check, and of course it is a draw. But when you're playing a team event, there's more pressure on the player of the white pieces to win. And after bishop takes c6, black got very good play with a typical break here at c5. And even though this position is about even, white's king, because of this g4 move, proved to be weak. And black won an excellent game. So Ukraine in a great position now. Brilliant win there for Volokitin. Let's move on to another key game of this round. And the next game we're going to look at is a major upset in the women's competition. Ho Yifang losing to a player rated over 400 points lower than the heart, the world's number one. And this was simply phenomenal. And again, it just shows you how hard chess is. Anyone who says, how can these people lose to someone lower rated? 
It happens all the time because the player of the white pieces here simply played a fantastic game. And she should be extremely proud of herself. And there's a very nice shot, if you search it on the internet, of her celebrating. She must be overjoyed with this result. A, 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 a once-in-a-lifetime result. And look what she does now in this position. White has a slight advantage. And with white, she goes for it again. The right attitude. G5. And after pawn takes g5, knight to h4. And now there is a constant threat of g6 breaking through on the king side. And of course, it was Harry the h pawn that made this all possible. And after some maneuvering about, white played this move g6, and Ho Yi Fang was in a whole world of pain. The knight moved, and then the queen came into the attack. And look at the way white played this attack. It was fantastic. Pawn takes h7 check. King takes h7. And now queen g6 may be stronger. But bishop takes f5 check is a brilliant shot as well. With the rook taken on e7 next. And white gains a serious material advantage and a winning position. So congratulations uh, to the player of the white pieces, Dana. Who only, God only knows how she's going to be celebrating tonight. But I wish her the best. And hopefully Yi, Ho Yi Fang will bounce back. She's a fantastic player. Okay, another key game. We'll move over. And this is my pick for the champions this year of the men's section were Azerbaijan. The tournament is held in Baku in Azerbaijan. And I know how strong and how how much they how good their team spirit is. I've met them before in their last team event. I know quite a lot of the members reasonably well. They're a lovely bunch of people. And they have this key guy on board one, Mamajarov who beat Richard Rapport yesterday in a lovely game, and he is playing out of his skin at the moment. And here he wins the match by winning with black, which is so important. We'll just dive into this position and just see how he finished off his opponent from Romania. Now, here the game went king g7. Black has a very nice advantage here, but it is opposite color bishop, so you want to avoid exchange of queens. And now look at what Mamajarov does here. He is great at rearranging his pieces. And slowly but surely, he goes bang. A major, beautiful hit here. And this is why he put his rook on c7. And the point of this is that now his d-pawn is free to move. The bishop was covering its square. Black eliminates it. And now watch Derek the d-pawn stroll down the board. And eventually, well, there's absolutely nothing that white can do because of this beautiful finish, queen e1 check. So Azerbaijan, my pick for this tournament, and they're doing extremely well so far. Next game. Okay, now how about the Americans? So far, not as promising as I'm sure a lot of you would have wished, but I have to say their match today against the Czech Republic was a very close and tough match where the Czech Republic played brilliantly. They played simply brilliantly. They made I looked at all the games and the Czech Republic hardly played any mistakes on any of the boards. So how can you beat a team like this? And even though you know you have your big free hitters in America, Nakamura, of course, Cariana and Wesley So, against good players, it's still not easy to win. And they drew the match. There was four draws in this match because it was literally a match of perfect games. Now, I'm going to pick out Nakamura's draw here. In this position, he is in a bit of trouble here. It's an ending where white is about to pick up a pawn. Now, a lot of players, even other grandmasters, might lose this position as, as black because the bishop is always stronger than a knight. But one key thing that Nakamura has learned recently is key defensive skills. Look at how he transforms the position. He goes knight b4, knowing that... Oh, this is after rook takes d5, knowing that... He's going to lose another pawn. And he enters into this rook ending by force. And this is where, if you know your technical endings, you will know how to draw this position. Now, I've won this position against IMs, International Masters, with white before. But this is one of the first kind of positions you should learn. In actual fact, it is a technical draw. Don't worry about what Komodo says. Komodo doesn't understand this. But it is a draw. But you have to know how to do it. Now, the first thing you do with black is try to establish your pawns over here and your rook on the seventh rank. Because the only way white's going to be able to win is to bring his king via b1 into the game 
In the meantime, you need to create counterplay on the other side of the board. So for example, rook a2, and here a brilliant move, g5. Now, I actually think king g2 is a slight error here from white. In this kind of position, white should be playing the move h4, stopping g5, or if g5, at least going h5, keeping some tension over there. This is a well-known thing, because as soon as black gets this g5 moving, technically it's known to be quite an easy draw. And we can see just how he does this. He keeps the white king trapped. He makes some weaknesses, exchanges pawns, and he gets a position which is a draw. No point playing on. Both sides understand this too well to play any more moves here. Okay, so let's now look at the last game. And the last game I'm going to consider is just the crazy Badar Jabava. Plays a lot on chess.com and his opponent, the ex world champion Tapalov. And Jabava won a great game. I just wanted to enter into the weird and wacky world of Jabava here. His crazy openings. And this is Georgia versus Bulgaria. And Georgia with the white pieces. Uh, white pieces? Well, should I say Jabava with the white pieces? Starts with the Jabava variation. And that is knight c3 here. A move that is a little bit like the London system, but it's the 21st century London system. And Jabava plays this move. Now, the point is he wants to go e4. So it kind of forces d5. And now he plays this weird system with bishop f4. It should be equal. But often, Jabava just outplays his opponent. And look at the way the opening goes. e6. And it seems like white is a beginner. Knight b5. Trying to take on c7. What kind of foolish behavior is this? Knight a6. And now the bizarre move, a3. And I was trying to think, what on earth is Jabava doing here? And let's have a look. C6, the knight comes back. So what does he try to achieve from this weird opening? My understanding is that he's wasted time with A3, but he has put this knight to the A6 square. And normally in the London system and such similar systems, this knight feels much more secure on the D7 square. This is where it likes to belong, on D7. So he's forced his knight to the side of the board and he just wants to play chess without any theory. Bishop d6, e3, and now we get an exchange on f4 where white has some hold of e5 and the opening, this weird opening, has been a Jabava success in the Jabava sense of the word. And he went on to play a brilliant, brilliant game to beat Tapalov. So I love the way he plays, my, my favourite player. Okay, now before I log off, a quick look at the standings after four rounds of the Olympiad. So we go to the open section first. We have China, and I put a bet on them four years ago. Was it four years ago? The last time the Olympiad happened to win, they're leading again. Now, I'm not going to mention the Netherlands today because they beat my... Well, I just did, so I broke that rule. But they beat my compatriots, the English team, very convincingly, three and a half to half. And clearly a good team. Now, United States still up there in seventh place, but they need to pull their finger out now, start getting some wins on the board. Early days, everything possible. In the women's section, we have Ukraine leading. Surprise um, on there, Serbia in second place. That really is a surprise. Now, one of my outside bets for this was uh, actually Iran to get a medal, but that's not proving to be coming very true at the moment. Okay, now the pairings for tomorrow. First, the open section. Some great pairings. We have Ukraine playing the leaders, China. Now, it's normally, you can see where it says MP on this scoreboard. That is what the main scoring is done, I believe. And the points is the board points. Netherlands have got quite a nice pairing against Belarus. One, one pairing they'd like to win. And I think America will be extremely happy against Serbia. They could have got Azerbaijan or India, who are much stronger on paper. I can only imagine what um, Egypt are thinking down there. They've got a lovely pairing. And some surprises coming from players like, well, countries like Mongolia. Moldova has some great players, but still a surprise. And those of you who know Eric Hansen and the chess bras, they are nibbling on board 10. Now, the women's section, Serbia are playing Ukraine, very tough. And really the favourites for this event are the three big ones, Russia, Ukraine and China. But really, quite early days yet. There's a long way to go, but it's a very exciting event. And 
I will tell you a bit more about the scandals here in my next one. There has been a big instance with someone being thrown out of the Japanese team for having a tablet on him. And there's some extreme cheating measures in place here. For example, my good friend from Luxembourg, Ball One for the females, the women's section, Fiona Stella Antoni, has started a petition. I don't know if it's her, but it, she signed it at least. Because at the moment, you can't go to the toilet unless you have a word with an arbiter and get their permission. Like being back in a play school again. Don't know what you think about that, but you can talk about that in the comments section. Okay, well, that's all from me. Um, I hope you enjoyed that little roundup of round um, four, and I'll be back with more roundups, hopefully of most rounds, the critical rounds, keep you in touch with what's happening in the chess event of the year. Let me know if you want more gossip or more chess. I will try to provide for you. Cheers for now. Goodbye.